Hey guys, it's me, Halloween Dan, and today's video is another weird one, another conversation video, because this is kind of like part two of the video I did the other week. So sorry if these aren't your favorite kind of video, but they kind of are mine. A couple of weeks ago, you might remember, some of you might remember, I did one of these random conversation videos where I talked about Halloween and one of the things that makes me love Halloween. And that week I was talking about the atmosphere of Halloween. And the reason this is kind of a part two is because it's kind of on the same thread. It's talking about the atmosphere of Halloween and what I think of as the perfect atmosphere around Halloween. These videos might not be for everyone and they certainly aren't like viral hits or something. I never get lots and lots of views from these videos. But at the same time, they're some of my favorite videos to both make, but they seem to be some of my viewers' favorite videos to watch. I always get such lovely responses whenever I do one of these videos, people saying, you should do more of these videos. Oh, these are my favorite of your videos and so on and so forth. And one person in particular contacted me just to say, you should make this like a weekly thing. A weekly thing might be a bit of a push for me. I'm not sure I could do this on a weekly basis, but I certainly could do this some of the time, a little bit more often now we are actually heading into Halloween. And what actually made me want to do this video today was actually in the comment section, my sister commented, shout out Faye, and she said, I know what you mean about the atmosphere of Halloween, but for me, it surrounds a particular place that I'll tell you about in a minute that just feels like Halloween all year, no matter when I visit it, mostly because of all the stories and the legends that surround it. So that today is what I'm gonna tell you about. I'm gonna tell you about this place that we used to visit, still do visit relatively often. It's very mythical, very magical. I'm gonna tell you the tale that surrounds it and then tell you what makes it the perfect Halloween atmosphere for me. So let's do this. So about 20 minutes from where I live is a small town called Alderley Edge. It's a lovely little town, but for, for most people from England, if they know of Alderley Edge at all, they probably know it as this place where football players and the, and the mega rich of the world kind of live. It's full of very expensive property and mansions and lights. It's a very fancy kind of ritzy place. But Alderley Edge has this other side to it. And that side is the one that I and my family, my sister and my brother in particular, were always very responsive towards. Because Alderley Edge is filled with myth and legend and magic. And a lot of it is to do with Halloween. So first of all, you have to kind of know a little bit of the geography in a weird kind of way. I don't know why this is important, but basically Cheshire, where I live, is very flat, very low lying. It's, it's only about 100 meters above sea level. So there's not a lot here going on. It's just open countryside. But sporadically, you'll get these huge stacks of rock that rise up into the air, seemingly suddenly just bump out of the flat Cheshire Plain. One of them is what another place we visited called Beeston Castle, where they built a castle on top of that big outcrop of rock. But in Alderley Edge, this is where it's just kind of filled with myth and legend. And there's a huge outcrop of rock and a sheer cliff face. And it's known as The Edge of Alderley Edge. And this edge is riddled with caves and caverns. It was a Bronze Age copper mine at one time. It's filled with all kinds of legends and myths and all sorts of weird and wonderful things go on there. And it's got a real sense of magic. It's surrounded by an ancient woodland, which was mostly the reason why we used to visit. And when I was growing up, apart from its association with very rich people, the other thing that it used to be associated with was to do with Halloween. When I was a kid, the most common thing you would hear about Alderley Edge was, oh, you're not allowed to go on Alderley Edge at Halloween. Why would be my innocent question? Well, because weirdos would frequent it at Halloween. People who thought they were witches or wizards or maybe even Satanists. They'd light bonfires up on the edge, get very drunk and usually just cause a lot of mayhem. And on an odd occasion, some of them would fall off the sheer cliff face and sadly die. And so eventually the police shut off Alderley Edge and said, no, you're not allowed on the edge at Halloween and that's the thing. So why on Halloween did this weird 
beauty spot with a sheer cliff face and all that kind of stuff. Why, why was it an attraction to people who thought they were witches and wizards and the likes? Well, that's because of the myth of Alderley Edge, the tale of Alderley Edge. And it's a tale I've heard so many times. I used to tell it to my brother and sister and it just made that whole place so much more magical. It literally elevated it to another level. So I thought what would be fun, I'd tell the legend, tell the myth, and then I'd tell you a little bit about the atmosphere of that place and what makes it so special. So the myth of Alderley Edge starts like this. Long, long ago, probably in the Middle Ages, the story starts as a farmer is traveling from one side of Cheshire to the other to sell a white mare at Macclesfield Market. Macclesfield's another town about 25 minutes from where I live. And as he's passing the edge of Alderley Edge, there's an old man with a long gray beard and a staff stood waiting at a gate that he has to pass. And as he approaches, the old man with the beard says, how much for the mare? And the farmer says, sorry, she's not for sale. I'm taking her to market where I think I can get a bit more money for her. So he carries on on his way. Gets to Macclesfield Market. There's a lot of interest in the mare. Everyone likes the look of the mare, but no one's willing to buy the mare, which is a bit weird. So by the end of the day, he's still not sold the mare. So the farmer has to walk back with the mare to where he lives. Once again, passing the edge of Alderley Edge. And once again, the same old man with the long beard and staff is waiting for him. This time, the farmer's a little bit happier to deal with this old man. And when the old man says, how much for the mare? The farmer agrees a price and the old man buys the mare. But the old man then says, follow me. And so the farmer, along with the, the old man, travel up the edge of Alderley Edge, climb up to, to the top of the edge, where they come to a huge cliff face and a massive boulder that's blocking their way. The old man taps the boulder with his staff and the boulder cracks in two and splits apart, revealing a huge metal gate in front of a cavern. It's at this point the farmer kind of realizes this isn't no ordinary old man, this is a wizard. So the wizard opens the gates and takes the farmer and the mare into the cavern. And when they get inside, they're hit by an astonishing sight. Inside, there are 15 giant knights, all fully laid out in all the armor and all the knightly stuff. And the farmer is shocked. Not that any of this that has happened before this, like the breaking open of a rock and stuff, none of that was shocking, right? This is suddenly shocking. So the farmer's looking at the knights and he notices that of the 15 knights, one of them hasn't got a horse. The other 14 have all got horses with them and the 15th one has no horse. Now it's, I should have mentioned, these knights and their horses are all asleep. The wizard enchants the horse that he's just purchased from the farmer and lays it down next to the 15th knight and the horse goes to sleep along with that knight. And of course the farmer then asks, what is this? Who are these knights? What is this all about? And the wizard replies, this is the sleeping army and they will only awake for the last battle of all battles at the very end of the world where they will rise from this cave to defend England, not Onimus at all. So then the wizard escorts the farmer from the cave, shuts the gate, closes the rock, and then poof, disappears. And the farmer's left alone wondering what the hell has just happened. Now that tale I've heard a million times and it's quite synonymous with Alderley Edge. And it's been sort of adapted and changed through the years as, as the myth and legend has been grabbed by different people. Some go as far to say that the 15 knights were actually King Arthur and the knights of his round table, which means that the wizard therefore is Merlin. And then there is all kinds of different myths and legend that Alderley Edge is one of about six different places that could potentially be the final resting place of either King Arthur or of Merlin or of them both. So there's a huge amount of myth and legend. All of it has a kind of a witchy, wizardy theme to it. There's even a well at Alderley Edge. So literally not far from the main cliff face of, of the edge, there is a face, a wizard's face carved into the rock and a little well beneath it with water trickling into it. And there's all kinds of stories about who, ooh, how did this face get there? Is it a real wizard? Who carved it? Mystery, mystery, mystery. The well is supposedly, he has healing properties. It's one of just one of those places that literally is so saturated with myth 
and legend that you're practically tripping over it every single time you go into it. So immediately, this was always a place that I loved. It was, I loved any place that had myths and legends surrounding it. And a place that was so close to where I lived, saturated in all these amazing myths and legends, was always a place I wanted to visit. But what's the link with Halloween, you're probably wondering. That's a great story, but what's the link with Halloween? Well, for me, the link is we would always go in October for a very specific reason. My dad loves chestnuts and is one of them old fashioned guys who likes to roast chestnuts on an open fire. So every October, when the chestnuts were ripe and they were usually on the ground, we would go chestnut picking. And Alderley Edge, the edge itself is surrounded by an ancient woodland. So you have all these really old, big old chestnut trees that always used to produce amazingly sized chestnuts. And we would go there for the very specific purpose and task of collecting chestnuts. And it was a lot of fun. And because this place was so steeped in myth and legend, I was always that guy to my siblings, my brother and sister, I'd be like, and have you heard of the wizard? And this was where the witches used to come and all that kind of stuff. And my brother was always a bit like, yeah, okay, Dan, whatever. But my sister, who was a lot younger, she was eight years younger than me, she is eight years younger than me, would be more like, really? And I'd be like, yes, this is where the wizards are. And she'd be like, wow. <laughs> but on a few occasions we would go, and even though it was all a bit of fun and it was all in jest, you would feel this real sense of magic to the place. And there's one occasion in particular that I remember, it kind of stands out, mostly because it's that perfect set of weather conditions that I mentioned in my last video that had literally engulfed the edge of Alderley Edge. So we'd gone chestnut picking with my dad and my dad was one of those. He didn't like sticking to the beaten track. Most people would take a path that took them directly to the edge where you could see the massive, the great views of Cheshire and all that kind of stuff. But my dad obviously was there to chestnut pick. So we would go in literally the opposite direction into the deepest parts of the woods that surrounded the edge to find these big chestnut trees. And I remember there was this one particular day we went and it was foggy and it was murky. There was blue sky and the sun was kind of out, but at the same time, it was kind of misty and murky as well. And as we went into this particular part of the woods, you had to descend down into the woods. The path kind of went down into a hollow that was below the main cliff face. The mist got thicker and thicker. And at that point, I always get that prickly feeling up my back of this is, this is so cool because at that point, the woods seem they could go on for miles. You know, the, the, all you can see are the tre trees directly around you. You have no concept of how deep or how massive these trees are or how far the woods spread. So the mist kind of conceals it, makes it a lot more mysterious. Eventually we'd reached the spots where the best chestnut trees were. And because it was not on the beaten track, we were often alone in these areas. There was very few other people there, probably usually just us rifling about in the undergrowth. And I remember on this one particular day, the fog was sort of all around us. It was misty and murky and the woods were silently still. And that's an eerie thing. I talked to my friend Scared Dad about this the other day that every now and again, you'll be in a woodland and woodlands are usually quite noisy places. The, the wind will be blowing through the branches. You'll hear creaks of trees. You'll hear little animals scurrying about and things. If it's not a squirrel, it's a dog. Someone's walking a dog or something. But on that day, there was complete stillness and silence and the mist hanging amongst the branches of the trees. And it did feel incredibly strange. Very, very eerie. I got that tingle up my spine again because the trees here were so enormous and the fog completely concealed the rest of the woodland except for what you could see directly around you. And it did, it had that feeling of, have I been transported back in time? Is this woods an ancient woods? Am I accidentally gonna trip over a log here and discover like a, a secret gathering of witches or something? And knowing that this place had all these myths and legends attached to it, there was a kind of a, a scary part in a way because you were suddenly at, in a place where these myths and legends have some gravity. You know, they have some real concept and some attachment to reality. But in the same way, you kind of, you know, discount that. No, I'm just in a woods. I just happen to be in this place and it just happens to be foggy and eerily silent. There was always one spot in that section of woodland too that I loved more than any other. 
and it was where there was a giant horse chestnut tree. It's the wrong kind of chestnut, the non-edible kind, the one we call a conker. But this tree was so enormous and it was kind of sat on its own in this hollow and you could travel all the way around it. No other trees came close to it. And on that day, the mist and the fog lingered around it. It was kind of almost like being hugged by the fog. And there was this absolute silence. And while my brother and sister and dad were off scurrying through the woods looking for chestnuts, I was stood by this tree just absorbing that silence, really taking it in and, and thinking about those myths and those legends and those things tied to this part of the world. And it wasn't hard to believe those myths and legends in that environment with the silence and the stillness and the mist and the murk. Eventually, we'd find our way out of that section of woodland and we'd travel up to the edge itself. And I remember on that day, because of the mist and the murk, by the time we'd reached the top, the mist had sort of parted and you could get this amazing view of the Cheshire Plain, which was still mostly covered by mist and fog and low-lying cloud. And it did feel like you were above the clouds. And there as well, you would have this real sense of magic. The little caves and the caverns and all these cool little nooks and crannies that you could hide out in, the woods and the trees were so deep and cool. And it just really was a truly magical place to visit. And it does sit in my mind, even now, as this truly magical Halloween environment, a truly cool place to visit. Anyway, guys, that'll be the last of these videos for a little while. I think I've talked enough about the atmosphere of Halloween and what makes me love it. It's just that at that time of year, visiting that mythical, magical place, it really did fill me with a sense of what makes Halloween special to me. And I've always said that for me, that linked to magicalness, mysticalness, spiritualness almost at Halloween is an incredibly important part of what makes Halloween special to me. And I think from the comments in the last video, it's a lot of what makes it very special to you too. But let me know in the comments. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching today and I will see you in the next one. Keep it spooky, bye.